Today, finally a rate cut, though weirdly, into a growing economy. Hello again, this is Martin North from Digital Finance and the Lotus World, and that is post covering finance and property news. Well, as expected, the Bank of England finally cut the base rate by 0.25% to 5%. That's the first cut in four and a half years. So today we've cut bank rate by 0.25 percentage points to 5%. It was, it was a finely balanced decision. Inflation has been exactly on our 2% target for two consecutive months. And inflationary pressures in the UK economy have eased much as expected. It was very nice to have music when I said, you know, said that, actually. <laughs> but this is very welcome news, as the, uh, as the music suggested. Um, now, at the same time, the UK economy has been stronger in recent months, and this is very welcome too. But it does add to the risk that inflation could be higher than we expected if we cut interest rates too much or too quickly though it was a finely balanced decision which reflected increasing confidence that the worst inflation shock in decades was easing. The Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey said inflationary pressures had eased enough to enable the first cut since the bank stopped ramping up borrowing costs this time last year. The MPC was split by five votes to four, exposing divisions within the central bank's most senior ranks, with Bailey casting the deciding vote for a quarter point reduction. Households which saw borrowing costs rise to the highest levels since 2008 financial crisis can look to lower mortgage rates, although the bulk remains on high fixed rates, at least for now. But Bailey said that savers and borrowers should not expect large reductions over the coming months and be concerns over lingering risks to the economy. We need to make sure inflation stays low and be careful not to cut interest rates too quickly or by too much, he said. Ensuring low and stable inflation is the best thing we can do to support economic growth and the prosperity of the country. With inflation holding at the bank's 2% target for a second consecutive month in June, financial markets had expected rates would be cut, although city economists correctly predicted it would be a close call. The pound fell against the US dollar and the euro after the decision. Now it's worth remembering that prices still remain significantly higher than three years ago and are still rising despite inflation falling back to the 2% government target in May. The bank remains concerned over stubborn price increases in the services sector of the economy and the resilience in wages growth. After its vote, the MPC warned that headline inflation was on track to rise to about 2.75% within months, overshooting its target. But the bank forecasts inflation will then fall back to about 1.7% in two years' time before dropping to 1.5% in 2027. And the bank has started to implement the Bernanke recommendations to improve their forecasting. And this includes the more formal use of scenarios, which shows there are several potential paths for inflation that could materialise. Either a continued reduction in inflationary pressures as high borrowing costs weigh on the economy and the job market slows, or a scenario with higher inflation for longer if economic activity remains stronger than anticipated. Households' perceptions of the current rate of inflation remain elevated, that's the blue line, but they have fallen sharply and tend to react to headline inflation with a lag. Similarly, firms' current inflation perceptions and inflation expectations over the short and medium term have also fallen significantly. That's the right-hand panel. All of this points to a continuing normalisation of wage and price-setting dynamics that the fall in headline inflation will feed through to inflation expectations and to weaker pay, wage pay and price setting dynamics. So, even if we judge that second round effects will take longer to unwind than they did to emerge, the evidence from these indicators is consistent with the view that second round effects will continue to fade with the restrictive monetary policy stance that we have put in place and the emergence of a margin of slack in the economy. There is, however, an alternative account of the economy which is less benign than our most likely projection. 
And this account reflects a view that MPC members put some weight on too, albeit to different degrees, when reaching their conclusions on the appropriate degree of restrictiveness in monetary policy. This view is that the economy is closer to the third, least benign case that I set out earlier, that inflationary pressures have become more ingrained in the UK economy as a result of structural changes in product and labour markets, as a lasting legacy of the major shocks that we have experienced. One possibility that the committee has considered is that the rate of unemployment below which inflationary pr pressures begin to build may have gone up over recent years. There is also a risk that recent upside news to economic activity could reflect stronger demand relative to supply, in turn increasing inflationary pressures in the UK economy over the medium term. Now, we can think of the alternative view as a prototype economic scenario of the kind that Ben Bernanke has recommended in his recent review of our processes in times of high uncertainty. As we develop our response to Dr Bernanke's recommendations, we will be in a position to articulate fully such scenarios. In the report we present today, giving some weight to an alternative, less benign view of inflation persistence, is reflected in an upside risk or skew to our inflation forecast. In fact, Britain's economy has grown at a faster rate than anticipated in recent months, exiting a recession in the first quarter with growth of 0.7%. That's double the levels recorded in France and Germany. While the economy flatlined in April, it grew at a faster rate than anticipated in May. The bank upgraded its growth forecast for this year to 1.25%. That's more than double the previous estimate of 0.5%, but it warned that quarterly growth would probably be weaker than in recent months, while unemployment was on track to rise. So rather than seeing the cut as a response to an emergency, this time it's the start of a slow, steady normalisation process. Signaling caution over its future decisions, the MPC said its policy stance would remain at restrictive levels that would bear down on economic activity even after the reduction in interest rates. Monetary policy will need to continue to remain restrictive for sufficiently long until the risk to inflation returning substantially to the 2% target in the medium term have dissipated further, it said. So, do not expect another rate cut next month. Now, of course, the politicians soon got in on the act, as Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt, the Conservative leader and shadow chancellor, claimed the decision showed that they had been making progress on the economy when in government, albeit too late, to benefit the former Prime Minister's gamble that falling inflation could strengthen his hand in the snap general election. But after the bank's announcement, the Chancellor Rachel Rees claimed millions of families were still facing higher mortgage rates after Liz Truss's mini-budget. However, Hunt argued that Labour's plans for above-inflation public sector pay increases risk keeping interest rates higher for longer. Actually, Bailey disagreed, telling a press conference that public sector pay rises would have little impact. Question flies along the um, news on public sector pay. A couple of things I'll say on that. First of all, in the Treasury, um, obviously we have, a, we have a Treasury representative who, who who's, uh, is, in, is in the committee. When we meet, we were very, um, very fully and properly briefed on it. Um, a chance for an spoke on it as well. Um, two things. First of all, we take really we would take the lead in terms of um, pay uh, indicators from the private sector because the private sector pay is, is feeding through directly into the in, in, into um, in, in, into CPI. But public sector pay obviously has an effect on demand and it can have, can have a signalling effect. On the whole, I think private sector pay tends to lead public sector pay. And that's what we've been seeing, actually, if you look in recent times. The second point I'll make is if you look at past behaviour and you look at the incremental news, and, and this is a very simple back-of-the-envelope thing, so I'm, you know, we'll, we'll get the full story with the budgets, obviously, because we haven't got the full story yet, because obviously we don't know how this is going to be funded. The Chancellor's got decisions to make on that front. There's a lot of analysis to do. The OBR is starting their process. And as you know, we condition our view on, of government policy on announced government policies, and that will come with the budget. But if you do a very simple back of the envelope on, on the increment to public sector pay that the Chancellor announced, I say increment because obviously there is an assumption already in there, going back to the budget earlier this year, 
Uh, the proverbial back of the envelope suggests an increment in inflation space, which is very small. I mean, you're in quite small second decimal place numbers at that point. So um, that's the back of the envelope. We'll get a much better story, obviously, by October the 30th when we get the budget. Thus, while the recession-battered Britain saw a small light at the end of the tunnel, the severe economic damage from Brexit, COVID and the inflation battle has led to debt to GDP close to 100%. Actually, with government debt equivalent to 99.5% of GDP at the end of June 2024, and it was 96.7% of GDP at the end of June 2023. If we remove the Bank of England's debt, we get an alternative measurement of government's underlying debt. Government debt excluding the Bank of England was 91.6% of GDP at the end of June 2024, compared with 86.8% of GDP a year before, at the end of June 2023. This will continue to put pressure on growth, even as the Chancellor this week announced a net black hole of more than £22 billion in the UK budget. Britain's new Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rachel Reeves, said that on taking office, she had uncovered a series of public spending pressures that were left unfunded, and undisclosed by the last Conservative administration, led by former Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and former Chancellor Jeremy Hunt. They included a £6.4 billion projected overspend this year on the asylum system and another £1.6 billion in unfunded transport projects, she said. Despite this, she said she would meet independent recommendations for pay rises for public sector workers with increases of 5 to 6 percentage points on average at a cost of around £9 billion this year. Reeve's statement will be viewed as an attempt to roll the pitch for possible tax rises at a budget which she said she would deliver on October the 30th. Labour, of course, is trying to pin the blame squarely on the Tories for the poor state of the national finances after the July the 4th election ended 14 years of Conservative-led governments. The budget would require difficult decisions across spending, welfare and tax, Reeve said, the first time she has explicitly indicated that she may opt to hike more taxes. However, the Labour government will also face questions about its own statements on public finances and commitments on tax during the election. The scale of the challenge has been evident for some time and was avoided by both political parties through the election, which landed Labour with a landslide victory on just one third of the votes cast. During the campaign, Paul Johnson of the Institute of Fiscal Studies accused both parties of being complacent with a conspiracy of silence about the inevitable trade-offs that were coming. Despite the tax burden heading for a post-war high, Rachel Reeves announced a slew of measures to shore up the UK's public finances. She said she would stop winter fuel payments to some 10 million pensioners, cancel planned reforms to adult social care, and scrap some transport projects in order to, quote, fix the foundations of the economy. If we cannot afford it, we cannot do it, she insisted in a speech to the House of Commons on Monday. The government will implement its policy to add 20% value-added tax to private school fees from January the 1st, that's according to documents published by the Treasury, and tax breaks for people with non-domiciled status will be removed for income arising after April the 6th next year, and Britain's energy profits levy will increase to 38% from November the 1st, the document said. The government also published a call for evidence on its election manifesto promise to tax the private equity industry more by treating carried interest as income rather than as a capital gain. In its manifesto, Labour ruled out raising the headline rates of income tax, the national insurance payroll tax or value-added tax, a promise Reeves repeated on Monday. But despite saying during the campaign that there were no plans for rises in other taxes, Reeves and Prime Minister Keir Starmer stopped short of making cast iron commitments not to hike capital gains tax or other levies on wealth, pensions and inheritance. That leaves scope for tax rises in the autumn. And so in summary, while the Bank of England did cut, the UK economy is not out of the woods yet and we should expect a tick up in inflation ahead. So the next few months data will still be important and taxes, of course, will continue to grind higher. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.